to our final speaker, uh, Anton. Um, so Anton, we'll let you get your presentation up. And um, again, if you've got any questions that you're formulating as you're listening to the presentations, please pop them into the, into the box and we can have time for a couple of questions at the end. Well, thank you so much. Let me just uh, bring up the slideshow. Are we in full screen looking good? We are, Anton, take it away. Excellent. Cool. Well, um, hello, everybody. It's great to be with you here. I'm an artist cartographer from New Zealand, actually, but I've been based out of Melbourne for eight years. Uh, and all my work is hand drawn in color pencil and ink. So today I'm going to be sharing my latest project, a world map of nature, but this is my follow up to a vast map of North America that took me almost five years to draw. A map that I won't have any time to discuss today, but uh, because of that map, most of the talks that I give are to American audiences. So it's really nice to chat to a more local cohort for once. Um, I often tell Americans that uh, superficially, just superficially, Australian cities don't look much different to theirs. We've got the strip malls and traffic, concrete, skyscrapers, you know, suburban life is familiar. But I tell them to get out of town here for the moment you're in nature, everything is different. There's no more squirrel, raccoon or bear. <clears throat> Instead, we've got wombat, koala and platypus. Redwoods or maple, they're swapped out for tree ferns and red gum. And it even sounds different. And we've got different bird song. The wind rushes through different leaves. There's a depth of spirit in nature that uh, our urban lives don't have. Now, of course, human culture has profound beauty and range far beyond just the US and Australia. But for all that is humankind, all our achievements and creativity, nature is just so much bigger. And we're a part of nature after all, a very impactful chapter in a story of billions of years. But we're changing so much, so fast. So I wanted to draw a map that focused on the non-human world, on nature, on wildlife, and on physical geography. Wild world is my take on a physical world map. So I started it in 2020, and this is the map today. Uh, I've drawn all continents except Antarctica and most of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's taking longer than I expected, which seems to be a pattern. <laughs> but um, today, we're going to take a little world tour and, uh, as we do, explore what this map might be about. But first, some of the origins. Now, I started this in the depths of a Melbourne lockdown. And uh, it's certainly inspired by the pandemic in ways. You know, it's a love letter to a world that I missed. Um, but I've actually had something like this in mind for years. This is a map I drew when I was about 15. And here, the animals themselves uh, reveal Earth through their negative space. Uh, but it actually goes back even further. Uh, this is from, I don't even know, I was six or seven. Um, and it's a native bird map of my home country, New Zealand. Uh, with a very sketchy looking whale off the North Island there. <laughs> and then recently, the world maps by Tom Patterson really caught my eye. I think his Equal Earth physical map is just stunning. You know, I love the simplicity, the flow of the labels, and I liked seeing no country borders at all, just allowing you to focus on physical geography. I imagined my own physical world map, but with landscapes and vegetation and wildlife an animal map that would also be a decent reference map for world geography. And given that animals are so good at evoking place, think, you know, tiger in India, kangaroo in Australia, that's powerful subject matter from which to evoke that sense of place, which is a kind of golden desire in cartography. Oh, I like to bake the illustrations into the geography so that everything flows. That snow leopard is wandering through the mountains. It's not stamped on top and make the map and the illustration one. So uh, I went with the natural earth for the projection, which is centered on 11 degrees east rather than the prime meridian. Um, and I love this projection. It's not an equal area projection, but it only has minimal exaggeration and sort of preserves the shapes of land masses beautifully, which is my most important uh, concern. Um, so the map is about a meter wide and half a meter tall. I printed the projection out in that size and then stapled it to the back of the drawing paper. So using a light pad here, I traced all the basics, coastlines, rivers, and topography. That's how I keep it very accurate. Um, so let me begin the very truncated world tour and discuss a few spots on each continent. 
Uh, so I began the map in North America, actually. So we'll start there. Um, I'm currently in the process of upgrading the Americas as they were the first places drawn. The style of the map has completely evolved since then, thousands of hours of, of experience. So the main change is that I'm drawing more fauna and flora, and these edits are already underway here in Alaska. Towering above other mountains is Denali, the highest peak on the continent. There's a grizzly with a mouthful of salmon. There's walrus, caribou, bald eagle, and raven. And there's also a bowhead whale emerging from beneath the Arctic sea ice. So the ocean that you find across the map, it is bathymetric. Um, it shows all the undersea relief that I carefully do with my blue pencils. But the poles are ice covered to their 2021 summer minimums, which is marked just below the polar bear. Uh, this is a stretch of the Pacific, uh, the North Pacific, the waters between Hawaii and North America, brimming with life, including the largest animal ever known, the blue whale. Now, the Western US is a region that I'm just about to substantially redraw. As you can see, it's a, it's a little sparse. It could use some giant redwoods in California. But we'll, we'll move on into South America. And oh man, I mean, <laughs> From the spine of the Andes, the Amazon River, the Pampas to Patagonia, what an incredible geography. Uh, in the north, there's a cotton top tamarind, poison frogs, and ocelots. The tepuis are here, which are the huge tabletop mountains of the Guiana Highlands, uh, with Angel Falls, the tallest mountain, uh, sorry, tallest waterfall on earth, tumbling off. And then I got to the Amazon rainforest, the most biodiverse place on earth. So how are the animals chosen? So my three basic guidelines for animal selection are these, wild, native, extant. So no thylacine or moa, unfortunately. Now these rules are guidelines, they can be bent a little, not every animal fits perfectly there, but they serve important functions. Wild and native animals put a spotlight on natural biomes only, while the exclusion of extinct animals, it places the map in the present day. This is a contemporary map of nature. This is a world that still exists, a world that can still be considered, can still be protected. Um, now, beyond these guidelines, I take a general look across the animal kingdom and just see what stands out. But in the Amazon, there are literally thousands of options. Now, some are easy, iconic choices, you know, macaw, sloth, anaconda. But I also love the weird and wonderful, like the bald wakari, that shaggy monkey with the bright red head. We'll go a little further south here uh, in a segment that spans from Easter Island to Iguazu Falls. Um, below the soaring Andean condor is the tallest mountain in South America, Aconcagua, almost 7,000 meters. And a Humboldt penguin gazes out to the ocean where a pair of endemic hummingbird perch on the Juan Fernandez Islands. After South America, it was time uh, to draw Europe. And from moose and bear in Scandinavia to lynx and bison, you know, the continent has far more interesting fauna than is sometimes appreciated. We uh, look to the south now, there's a, an ibex in the Alps, while an Italian wolf sits upon Rome, according to legend founded by Romulus and Remus, two brothers raised suckling a mother wolf. Across in Greece is the owl of Athena uh, standing on Athens. So when choosing animals, culture is a consideration. You know, animals have been used as symbols around the world more than probably anything else. But too much adherence to symbols could run against the non-anthropocentric themes of the map. But there are limits to cultural symbols. And uh, before my three rules for choosing animals were properly set, um, I drew a rooster, it will come up there, a rooster in France and a bull in Spain, which are both very iconic, but as I kept going, they really bugged me. You know, they didn't fit, they're not wild animals. And channeling bullfighting just didn't seem to match the tone of the map either but I did see something in the bull. You know, it made me think of the aurochs, the great wild ancestors of domestic cattle that once roamed Europe. They loomed large there until their extinction in the 1600s. And I, I thought of the uh, beautiful paleolithic paintings in the caves of Lascaux, France, with wild horses and deer, and of course, aurochs. But they can roam a map that includes extinct animals. I picked up my eraser, and changed that rooster into a uh, red kite and the bull into a Cantabrian brown bear. So Europe was rewilded. Next up was a continent that I'd been anticipating from the start, Africa. 
And what can I even say here? In a map about animals, I mean, I spent weeks just getting through the Sahara Desert, the world's largest hot desert, stretching thousands of kilometers from the Mediterranean to the Sahel. Uh, sand seas known as ergs, they stretch to infinity, while between them, mountain ranges like the Tibesti and the Ayer, they are oases of wildlife. You go to East and Central Africa, uh, in the top right, you can see the Great Rift Valley tearing through the Ethiopian highlands, home of the amazing gelada, the bleeding heart monkey. And uh, past that giraffe at Lake Victoria, where above wildebeest and umbrella thorn is Kilimanjaro, highest mountain in Africa. Over in the vast Congo rainforest, there's a mountain gorilla, gorilla at the Virunga volcanoes. And deep in the jungle, you'll see bonobo and forest elephant. So um, I could spend five hours on Africa. I could spend 10 hours on Asia, which was the next continent and an enormous challenge. Both of them took months to draw. And Asia was hardcore. I mean, the sheer scale and diversity here is just mind boggling. All of the world's highest mountains crisscross through the middle. It spans from the Arabian desert to Siberia to the jungles of Borneo. And the animals are incredible. So um, we'll just have to pass through a few moments here, but uh, let's look at the mountains because this has changed the way that I draw mountains forever. I mean, the Pamirs, the Karakoram, the Himalayas, these are the highest mountains on earth. And it is intense drawing animals in this kind of geography. Almost every mountain here is a specific peak drawn from a photo. And uh, you'll see Everest just above that golden monkey towering above all as the highest point on earth. To the far east, home of the Siberian tiger, Amur leopard. Uh, Japan has the Blackestons fish owl, the largest owl on earth, sacred to the indigenous Ainu in Hokkaido. There's a Japanese macaque just above Mount Fuji with pink cherry blossoms drifting out to sea. In Korea, there's a goshawk and a Korean magpie, the national birds of North and South Korea. Now, I love that this map has no borders, that the world can be viewed flowing as one, just as it does from high above. A landmass doesn't appear carved up and color coded. Now, political world maps are essential and they can be beautiful, but their dominance as the preferred world map uh, or globe flavors the way that we imagine the world. That is by its nations rather than its nature. Borders are human inventions. You know, animals don't know what they are, even if they may be impacted by them. So in this map, the Korean peninsula is unified, but I wanted to still hint at that divide with these different birds. <clears throat> so now we get to go to our part of the world. What you are looking at now is uh, wild world Australasia. Just before Christmas, uh, I released this completed region as a limited edition print. The first prints taken from wild world. In the bottom right corner, you can see a stretch of night sky, including the constellations of Orion and Pleiades. The final world map will have sky and all, uh, space in all four corners. And over here is the cartouche I drew especially for it, placed in the corner in Photoshop. Um, so as I complete the ocean, there will be additioned prints of every continent. The next up is the Americas. Um, and with just so much detail on the map, I'm thrilled to be able to spotlight each region. So prints of Wild World Australasia are still available on my website. I'll link to that in the final slide. But let's go to Australia, a place as we know, like nowhere else. By Jim Jim Falls up at Kakadu is a saltwater crocodile. There's a red kangaroo hopping past Uluru in Katajuda. There's a cassowary in the Dane tree. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef erupting with life, including giant clam and moray eel. So I've been lucky enough to call Australia home for nine years and it's, it's, it's nature which has always filled me with wonder. Quick look at my neck of the woods, probably quite a few of yours. Uh, in the southeast, we've got kookaburra, quoll, a yellow-footed rock wallaby in the Flinders Ranges, a hairy-nosed wombat on the Nullarbor. And in Melbourne, there's a grey-headed flying fox. Uh, thousands of them live just a short walk from me and on the Yarra. And beneath Kosciuszko and Bogong is a lyrebird out to sea, there's a white-bellied sea eagle. There's an eastern brown snake, a reminder that Aussie wildlife is half cuddly, half deadly. And uh, I couldn't even look at photos of our spiders long enough to draw them, to be honest. Um, although I did manage to get a red back in WA. And down in Tassie, by the little penguin swimming off the coast is a Tasmanian devil growling beneath Cradle Mountain. And finally, my home, Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
There's the Kia, the world's only alpine parrot with its fiery underwing beneath our highest mountain, Aoraki, which is 1500 meters taller than Kosciuszko, just uh, for the record. And uh, um, a great spotted kiwi is under Nikau Palm. Um, in the north, our native pigeon, the Kereru, is near flowering Pahutukawa. So that is the basic world tour from Alaska to New Zealand. Um, and this is the map as it stands right now. Still quite a way to go, but I'm hopeful that I'll finish the entire project in 2023. So I just want to wrap all of this up by going to China for a moment, because it's a very interesting part of the map. It's such a beautiful place, you know, from the karst landscapes in the south to the Gobi Desert, and such wonderful animals, the panda, clouded leopard, salamander. But the absence of humans in this map is very notable in a place like China. I mean, there are less than 2,000 giant pandas left in the wild, alongside 1.4 billion people. The great sturgeon of the Yangtze is almost extinct, while China has over 5 billion chickens. The degree to which we've changed the ecology of this earth is staggering. And so the map certainly has an idealistic tone, you know, for in reality, cities, industry, and people dominate Eastern China and much of the world. Europe has almost 800 million people, most of its wilderness tamed long ago. But the only hint of civilization here is the animals I didn't draw, like the aurochs, now just painted on the caves of Lascaux. In Brazil, uh, most of its Atlantic forests are gone, and many animals are critically endangered. But on this map, Rio's Sugarloaf Mountain is dominated not by a statue of Christ, but a golden lion tamarind. There are so many places where human impact is overwhelming, but the world is still wild. You can find it on every continent and across the islands to the sea. From the Amazon jungle to the heart of Europe, where the Alps and Carpathians are strongholds of a wild world. But still, you know, even on this map, our impact is present. The Anthropocene is knocking. You know, I might not be drawing cities, but the dried up bed of the Aral Sea is there. I didn't draw the Amazon burning, but I drew its current extent, which is changing quite rapidly. Uh, some of the animals I've drawn are shockingly rare. In the Sahara, the Scimitar oryx actually went extinct in the wild 20 years ago, but uh, it was reintroduced successfully. So here it is in Chad, a glimpse of hope. Nonetheless, some animals on this map may soon be no more real than the aurochs in Lascaux. And maybe that's what this map is about anyway. It's a wild timestamp uh, from this era. It does present things in an idealized way. And I've wondered about this presentation of Earth as a wild cornucopia, which it is, but it also isn't anymore. It's also shocking what we've done to nature. So outside of teaching about geography and animals, what is this map about? What does it show? But that's not just for me to determine. That's uh, all about what you see in it too. I'm just drawing it and seeing what unfolds, you know. Um, but I've got a lot of ocean to draw, so I'm going to leave it there. And, and uh, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Anton. Uh, and wow, um, I think particularly after the last couple of years that we've had, um, it's been a real uh, pleasurable whirlwind to be transported to all the worlds and landscapes that you've created. Um, we haven't got too much time, uh, but there aren't, too, I don't think there are any questions in the chat, um, but if you'd like to quickly put one in there, please do. Um, oh, I think something's come up there. Uh, so we've got a question for you, Anton. How many blue pencils have you used on the map? Well, I actually have a special cup just for blue pencils since I started the ocean uh, because I go through them like nothing else. I mean, to do that, a layer of ocean, I do basically three to four layers um, of just blue and then I smooth it out with a paper stump and then more blue, smooth it out again, and then I start to work in the actual bathymetry. So I don't have a number for you, but it's it's a lot more than any other pencil, I can tell you that. Considering, of course, the ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface. I might throw, throw a question in there uh, and get you all to, to quickly give us a response. Um, your personal experience of the world is at the heart of your maps. Do you find that as a result, audiences connect with your work on a more personal level? 
And have you got any examples that you could share with us? I would say just very quickly, um, the answer is definitely yes. I mean, the because most maps are made on computers these days, doing them by hand alone, just that anachronistic nature of it is uh, is always a point of interest and a point of connection to people. Um, and also just the stories behind it, you know, this the personal uh, odyssey that you have to go through to complete a map that it took, takes six months, you know, five years, three years, whatever it might be, that people can relate to that because we've all had to go through multi-year odysseys to get from point A to point B. And that's a very human story. Melinda or Adam, did you have a response? I actually, it was just great to hear Adam's um, recollection of laminating the map back in the 1990s and, and being inspired by that. So the, the joy for me at this point in my life is, is hearing those stories. And I've, I've heard quite a few of them over the years. But um, what I find with maps is as soon as somebody sees our map, um, uh, and and has one of their own it becomes their map it's not mine um, and uh, it's something that they they re, you know they just delve into it they find the place where they, they live or work or have visited um, it's um, a constant um, source of discovery because there's things around those areas um, and sharing and stories so it, it becomes their map it's my map of you know Ballerine or Melbourne on the wall and visitors um, share those stories and have the same wonder. And I think um, that especially for young kids, it just gives them a, a whole different visual perspective of where they live or where they're visited. And it has so much more connection than seeing it on the screen. So for me, those experiences are just, that's what drives me, um, you know, every, every day with just the, the discussions I have and the, the feedback and the emails and and um, again why I'm on this mission to encourage young people who have um, that desire to make their own maps even to start really really small um, you know in their their neighborhood but to 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 um, ignite that and to hopefully help people develop that and any other map makers out there that that I can help with you know the production side is 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 what I'm aiming to do at this point. I think that's a, a really lovely way of thinking of it, Melinda, as passing over ownership to um, the audiences that are going to be engaging with your work. Um, we've had another couple of questions come through, um, but Adam, I just might give you um, the chance to um, respond. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, sim similar to what the other two said, it's just this map at the moment is is living in my head and it needs to come out. I'm just so bound to to finish this map. And, and like Melinda said as well, um, once we make this map and someone else sees it, they start their own journey as well. So I think that's what the the magical part of this. And I'm not great at words, but I can draw. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a story or the base of the story, and then people run with it. And and it's so fascinating to see little kids, because I was fortunate enough to, to, to have one of my maps as, as a wallpaper in a new um, redevelopment of Emerald Library, and, and to sort of see people interact with that as well, and just sort of sparks the imagination, and it is so amazing to, to see that, and I feel so removed from the process. For me, it's not me that's doing that, it's the map, it's the separate entity, and uh, it's just fantastic to see people using their imaginations in a, in a way that wouldn't ordinarily happen. So it's really, really great to see. Well, that's uh, about all we've, we've got time for. Uh, we just had a question about when the recording will be available. Uh, unfortunately, we were a little bit late in starting the recording, uh, but what we did record, which I think we missed maybe about the first six minutes or so, uh, it will be made available and we'll, we'll let you know. Um, I just, wanted to thank all three of our speakers um, for such engaging pres presentations and fascinating insights. And I wanna thank our audience for, for coming along for the ride. Uh, please stay tuned because there'll be another couple of ANS Maps webinars throughout the year. 
Um, and I'd also give a plug for, for membership of, of ANS Maps. If um, you're not already a member, you might want to uh, consider it. Um, I've just put a link to our website in, in the chat there. Uh, we produce a peer review, peer review journal and we have a conference each year. So um, please, please do check it out. Um, but we will say goodbye now and I look forward to seeing you all at the next ANS Maps event and bye for now.